very good afternoon to you all um, and welcome to this very exciting panel session uh, where we'll be exploring the ethics of new citation tools and technologies. My name is Libby Gerd, I chair the LISP Biometrics Committee and I'm also a research policy manager at Loughborough University. I want to make it very clear from the outset that I am not an expert in either ethics or citation based tools and technologies. Um, but like many of us in the LISP Biometric uh, practitioner community, I think I know enough to be worried and not enough to know what to do about it. Uh, so last year I wrote a piece called uh, AI based citation evaluation tools, good, bad or ugly, uh, to try and outline some of my concerns, you know, and they were along the lines of if our tools only index a subset of the scholarly literature, how can we rely on the results of our analyses? And if the literature itself underrepresents some groups, women, the global south, is this problematic? And if technologies like natural language processing are applied to texts where language is not natural, i.e. it's off the second language, will it still work? And who gets to design these technologies anyway? And I can tell you, having invited um, a lot of developers to join us at this year's event, there have not been many women. You know, does that matter? And are, are the rules that they're building into these technologies leading to fair outcomes? And, and Ludo has mentioned, um, made reference to this in his excellent keynote. And of course, when the outcome is a results list from a literature search, that's quite different to an outcome which seeks to evaluate research or researchers in some way and makes a difference to their lives and their careers. And if new technologies aren't working as well as they might, you know, what on earth can we do about it? And again, Ludo kind of touched on that in his keynote and kind of showed us this uh, spectrum of kind of moving from excited to concerned to kind of a rebalancing about how we use these new technologies. You know, where are we on that spectrum? How can we speed up? You know, especially when a lot of these services are free to use, you know, and I, and I often sit here wondering, are we trying to close the stable door once the hot horse has bolted? Thankfully, I am surrounded today by a group of experts with significant knowledge and experience in the field of ethics, AI, and citation-based technologies, who I'm hoping will help us to answer some of these questions. So to save some time, because we've got a lot, it's a big area, <laughs> we've got an hour and a half to look at this. Uh, I've asked Thane Chambers to um, post all the speaker bios into the chat for us. Uh, so we don't have to spend a lot of time introducing speakers. I hope that's okay for with everybody. Um, and I'm hoping that we can use this session to kind of separate out what we do need to worry about and what we don't need to worry about, you know, and to explore how we might address any ethical concerns going forward. So this is how it's going to work. So after putting a call out on Twitter, I've gathered some of the community's questions already, uh, and I've asked each of our six esteemed panel members to address one question in three or four minutes. Now, this is very cruel of me uh, because I know they could each speak for at least an hour and a half on their topic, but I'm going to set my alarm uh, and be very strict. So during this time, when they're kind of responding to these preset questions, please do feel free to put your own questions in the Q&A uh, because when they're done, I will kick off with a question and then I'm going to open the floor to you. And then kind of towards the end, you know, I'm sure we'll have solved all these problems by about 10 to 5. So at that point, we're going to ro uh, round up uh, by asking all our speakers what one thing they think we could do to move forward more ethically in this space. So first up, I have invited uh, Dr. Erin Young, a research fellow from the Alan Turing Institute, to address the question as to whether it matters that new technology development is so male dominant. So I'm going to pass over to you, Erin, and mute myself. Thanks, Erin. Thank you so much. Um, and as Elizabeth said, it's a massive topic. So I will try and do my best to squeeze it into three minutes. Um, so yeah, I'm a postdoc research fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, and I co-lead the Women in Data Science and AI project. We sit within the public policy program and our main aim is to use data science and social science methods to inform policy in order to increase the equality of women um sorry equality in general and, and the number of women working in data science and ai fields um and just to give you a bit of uh, a, a, an indication of the problem um only about 22 percent of the uk data and ai professionals in the uk are women uh this drops to only about 14 percent 
for engineering and then 9% for cloud computing. Uh, so there's a huge problem. And we explored this deficit in our recent report, Where Are the Women? Mapping the Gender Job Gap in AI, which you can find on our website. Um, and we did find that they're massively gendered careers in technology and more specifically in data science and AI. And so in short, yes, it really matters um, that new technology development is so male dominated. And this is for a number of reasons. So obviously uh, social and economic justice um, are two of the biggest reasons as well as value and diversity. But then we look at this piece around um, how the, the low numbers of women and marginalized groups working in new tech development are creating different biases in AI. And so this is the idea that, of how the world is designed and for whom. And so essentially tech isn't neutral. It's not gender neutral, race neutral, age neutral, ability neutral. Um, technologies are shaped in all sorts of ways across all fields and sectors. And the ways in which people build them reflects their history, their values, their choices. And so along the whole data pipeline, along the whole development pipeline, um, the kinds of decisions that are made for example, the kinds of data sets that are used, different decisions around the models, algorithms, design decisions, even the types of things which are explored will obviously be impacted by uh, the large number of men working in the field. Um, and we've seen lots of examples of this in the media recently of this feedback loop of bias. So I like to say bias in, bias out. Um, and I think it's crucial as well just to mention that it's not about the bad intentions of the designers. It's not about men's bad intentions. They're not designing this into the system, um, but it's the fundamental architecture of the systems. If we have uh, a large number of men or a large number of one certain group, um, of course, that will um, shape the technologies that are designed. And so um, just in my last few seconds, just to say a few different ways we can tackle this, and we offer a large number of policy recommendations in our work, um, but things like standards for inclusion, best practices, um, transparency, that kind of thing are all ways in which we can um, tackle this problem and start to improve it. So I hope I've kept the time. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Fantastic, you're under time. Well done, Erin. <laughs> Thank you very much. I can pause my timer because it didn't need, didn't need to go off. Uh, fantastic. So next up we have uh, Professor Stephen Pinfield, who is based at the iSchool at the University of Sheffield, and we've asked him to address the question as to whether AI-based, artificial intelligence-based peer review um, bakes in existing biases. And I've got some slides that I'll be forwarding on Stephen's behalf. Okay, thank you very much, Lizzie, and hello, everybody. Pleasure to be with you. So to uh, begin to answer this exam question that Lizzie has set me, I'd like to report to you some research that I've recently undertaken with some colleagues at Sheffield and also Rome, uh, the two cities built on seven hills. And we've recently published this, and I'd like just to uh, describe some of our findings. So if we look at the next slide, there's a very brief description of what we did. We um, trained an AI tool to mimic the decision-making of peer reviewers with a view to designing something that could assist peer reviewers rather than replace them. Um, and what we did is we took a large set of peer-reviewed engineering conference papers and we used half the set to train the tool and the other half to use as a test of the accuracy of using the tool. And we were able to predict with a fair degree of accuracy um, the decisions of peer reviewers based on quite superficial uh, metrics and indicators of different kinds, particularly around the standard of the written English, the presentation and formatting of a paper. And what we found basically was that if the manuscript was well written, it used appropriate terminology for the discipline, it, and it was well presented, it was more likely to be accepted. So if you go on to the next slide, we can see there are a number of possible reasons for this. It might be, first of all, that these superficial metrics are a fairly good heuristic of the overall quality of the paper. If the paper is presented and read, reads badly, it's more likely to be a lower quality paper in other more substantial ways. That could be uh, the case. On the other hand, it could be that what we're seeing here is what might be called first impression bias, 
where a peer reviewer comes to a paper, gets an initial negative impression by the fact it's formatted badly or maybe written in bad English and therefore is predisposed to reject it. And that more likely uh, results in a rejection decision. Now, if you were to turn this kind of tool into a usable tool, we could see a number of possible uses, although not necessarily always recommended. It could be a pre-submission tool. So it could be something that authors put their papers through in order to assess whether it's likely to meet a first impression bias so they can correct it in advance of submission. It could be something that uh, editors and peer reviewers use to flag potential problematic papers. And as a result of that, maybe reducing the number of desk rejects by automating an initial filtering process. It could be used that way. Or it could be used to do large scale analyses on papers to understand the pattern of decisions of peer reviewers. But there are quite a few ethical problems here. And if we look at the final slide, we've, we've listed some of these ethical concerns we might have as a result of this uh, research. First of all, there is the real danger of biases being frozen into code. We can debate whether it, they're frozen in or baked in. I think it means pretty much the same thing. Um, where, for example, using tools to make decisions ongoing based on decisions that have been made in the past is inevitably inherently conservative. You're asking the tool to repeat the kind of decision making that has been made in the past. And that could mean, for example, biases against people whose English is not their first language or authors from particular regions where patterns in their writing styles could be picked up and therefore potentially more likely to be uh, rejected. So there's a danger of that freezing or baking in. There's also a danger of uh, a lack of transparency associated with uh, these uh, tools. We were using a lot of parameters in this fairly simple tool, very difficult to explain. And that can lead to a lack of trust if the uh, tool is opaque. And finally, um, there's a danger of an AI tool like this actually influencing decision making of humans, even though it's only designed to inform decision making. It could be that if a tool flags a problem that the reviewer is then um, more inclined to reject it because the tool is saying it's potentially problematical. Once again, reinforcing these kinds of biases that could be there in the tool. And it seems to us that these kinds of things need to be addressed both through um, improved technology, but also through effective governance mechanisms to, ex to begin to discuss how we deal with these kinds of uh, potential biases and ensure that they don't occur at large scale. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you ever so much, Stephen. That was really interesting. I did enjoy reading your paper. Um, so next up we have uh, David Pride. David is a research fellow at the Open University uh, and he's, he's going to answer the question for us in three or four minutes um, whether there are cultural and disciplinary differences in the ways that works are actually cited and whether this might affect the outcomes of citation based tools. So David again I've got some of your slides and I'll, try and I'll kind of forward those on your behalf. Thanks for the introduction, Lizzie, and I just appear to
not open metrics and it comes down again to this question of whose count counts and i'll try and speed up a bit here because you see on the right hand side there's there's many of the subjects there that actually have what's regarded as non-citable output so you've got media dance film etc and this way using blunt citation data for ranking in inverted commas particularly at the level of the individual author um becomes extremely um problematic um if you just flick to the next slide um, and this, this is a lovely quote here, and the, this is from the Hefke report on the pilot exercise for the REF, and they concluded that citation data information is not sufficiently robust to be used formulaically or as a primary indicator of quality for the REF. And despite that huge caveat, 11 of the 36 UOAs you just saw did allow their peer review panels to use citation data, and one should not be therefore too surprised to see that the peer review rankings for the G GPA rankings of the Institute very, very closely co um, aligned with the citation data in those areas. At the other end of the scale, it was not associated at all with it, and that, that shouldn't come as, as, as a surprise. So if we, if we go to the next slide, this is a slightly different take on it. And one of the, this is a look at the global aspect of it. And one of the simplest differences to demonstrate in a short amount of time is the large variance in self-citation rates around the world, which speaks volumes about cultural tendencies for self-promotion or, 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 or otherwise. And this, this table here is from a recent study by Nick DeShat and Birgit Mays, and they divided the world along an individualism scale where you have the highly individualistic societies, the US, the UK, um, etc., at one end and more collectivist societies at the other. And they found clear differences in citing, citing practices. Um, and this also outweighed the known differences for men to cite at a higher rate than women. And I'm almost out of time when we haven't mentioned language differences, the bias towards English as the, the lingua franca, um, the, the, which emits a huge swathe of global research, um, particularly of that from the global south. And so with the cultural differences, the gender differences, the language differences, and the domain differences, I, I genuinely feel that building equitable, transparent and responsible metrics based on citation data still presents huge challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, David. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you for sticking to time. So next up, um, we have um, Professor Cecile Janssens, who uh, spoke at our first date, um, this Mirror Metrics conference on uh, co-sites. She is the founder of co-sites and based at Emory University in the US. Um, and she has agreed to respond to this statement, which is rubbish in, rubbish out, the importance of data quality to new citation technologies. So Cecile, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for inviting me here. Um, I broadened your, uh, your scope a little bit, not only looking at the data quality, but also at the quality of the algorithm. Um, as you said, I am, um, I'm a professor of epidemiology and I, I am, I am uh, working on research methods. I'm a methodologist and I am developing research tools. And what we do with developing research tools, it's not that we start with what technology can do, but what we want the tool at the end of the day to be. So we develop our tools with uh, what the researchers want. We have their perspective in mind and put that as a requirement on what we want to develop. So we use COSA, we developed COSITES, and it is a search tool for researchers, it's for searching scientific literature. Um, and we wanted that tool to be effective and efficient. So it needs to return relevant results and ideally not too much more that is not relevant. But we also find it important that the um, algorithm is intuitive, that it makes sense to the researchers because we have to research, we're asking researchers to trust the algorithm and for that it needs to make sense um, uh, both in terms of the algorithm and the, and the data. Also, we want our tool to be reproducible um, and accountable. So two uh, very important values in, in research. Um, uh, it means that if uh, two researchers uh, search on different computers, different side of the worlds, the exact same search that they get the same results and that not the results are um, influenced. Sometimes you want that, but sometimes you don't want it influenced by what you have searched uh, before. And it needs to be accountable that you can describe in a research paper how you, how you did your search. So basically, these are our requirements that we put on the technology in, in developing uh, the algorithm. Next slide, please. So because we know that the quality of a search tool 
uh, of the results that it produces has two main components, the quality of the algorithm and the quality of the data. And so um, if you want to make a, a, a strong algorithm and use very relevant data, you have to make the decisions beforehand um, to what level of detail, what level of information can you get out of citation data? Can we trust that researchers, when they cite articles, that they cite articles that are relevant to the topic of the paper? Can we trust that researchers think where to cite an article, in which sentence, which paragraph, or which section? And can we trust that researchers cite the, um, uh, the articles correctly? Now, I wish that the answers to these three questions were yes, but they are, uh, from our view, they are not. Researchers make tons of mistakes in interpreting research studies and then citing them wrongly. Um, we hardly think about where to put citations in, in, the, in, the, in the manuscript. We, we know, of course, we, that the introduction has different um, uh, contents than the, than the method section, but we don't think too much about where in the sentence or which of the sentence we put citations. So we feel felt that the, the deepest level of citation information that we can trust from citation data is that the article is relevant to the topic of the paper. And the same comes also to selecting which data you want to use for, um, for your um, search tool is basically answered by the question, what do researchers want and what do they trust? Do researchers only want peer reviewed information? Then you may need to develop your tools and curate the databases that are strongly um, um, curated. Do they also um, trust non-peer reviewed papers? Um, of course, these days we have the preprint services. So for that, they may say yes, but for other scientific journals that are not peer reviewed or even more towards um, you know, um, and not maybe high standard quality um, at all. Maybe researchers don't want that. And also the question is whether researchers want other data than, than scientific, uh, specific scientific journals when they search the literature. So also for this too, you know, of course you can develop search tools that, that encompass the entire, you know, all kinds of documents. Um, but we developed GoSites very strongly be, uh, based on a very simple algorithm that, to our knowledge, is the deepest level of information you can get from a uh, citation uh, uh, method. That's simply, it's basically, it's related to the topic. And we only wanted to develop the methods in um, a curated database because we don't expect that researchers um, want, are also interested in all kinds of reports for which they don't, cannot evaluate the quality themselves. So that is where that is in a, in, a, in a nutshell how I think about rubbish in rubbish out. I'm not saying rubbish. Um, it is it is it is really looking at what the researchers want. If researchers want more literature than only peer reviewed journals only, then you may create a, may use a wider database. If you think that uh, researchers uh, expect that the best quality research is published in peer reviewed journals, then you can as well restrict to a curated data. Fantastic, thank you very much, Cecile. Um, so now we have um, our keynote speaker actually from today, Professor Ludo Waltman um, of CWTS Leiden. Uh, and we've asked Ludo to ad address the question um, as to whether new services based on open citations offer us any advantages over those based on closed citation sources. So Ludo, over to you. Uh, thank you, Lizzie. I think I essentially already gave the answer in the, in the keynote. The answer is yes, uh, fr from my perspective. So um, um, as I tried to explain in, in, in earlier today, uh, the openness of citations is in the end, the only way in which research intelligence tools can be made truly transparent, pluralistic and, and, and democratic. Uh, so any restriction that is imposed on openness will also impose restrictions on these three values of transparency, pluralism and, and, and democracy. Um, so yes, we need therefore citations to be open. I have a few perhaps things I could add to this, uh, to, to, to the thing I mentioned in the, in the keynote. First of all, openness of citation data is a kind of narrow way of thinking about, about um, um, what we need, because citations are, of course, just one kind of data element that we typically uh, need for bibliometric analysis, for uh, properly using bibliometrics to, for instance, inform uh, research evaluation. So we need all kinds of other metadata elements. Um, so open citations, in my view, is just one element of a broader uh, uh, development that make, needs to take place towards openness of bibliographic metadata. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that actually we can look at openness from 
two perspectives. So we tend to think about openness of citations from the viewpoint of um, being able to um, access and reuse citation data. But there's also another way in which you can think about openness. So suppose you are an, an editor or a publisher of a journal, then actually openness of citation data also means something else. It means being able to share the, uh, the, 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 the citations generated by your journal, so the reference list, share them with the research community. Um, what we see in, 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 in uh, some of the closed uh, proprietary data sources is that they themselves decide what they index in their databases, like Web of Science as Scopus. So there we have another restriction on openness. So journals are excluded. They are not given the possibility to make their, their uh, reference list openly available. And the open, uh, uh, the open infrastructures have the advantage, at least some of them have the advantage of being open also from this other point of view. So not imposing limitations on who is kind of allowed to make citation data openly available. So it goes in two directions. That also means, and that's the third point, that we need filters. If anything goes, if anyone could make citation data openly available, that also means we will have a lot of rubbish, to use that term. Um, and that means we need filters, as already mentioned by Cecile. We need filters that help us to decide what, what is important, what is relevant, what is valuable. And actually, that is a thing that uh, databases like Web of Science and Scope provide to us. They provide filters to us. The thing is that these filters are not democratic. These filters are made by companies that have their own criteria. They probably try to do a good job in, 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 in creating these filters, but it is just one single perspective on how filtering can be done. So these filters themselves also need to be uh, kind of made in a democratic way. And anyone should be able to contribute to creating those, those, those filters. And that I think is now the big challenge that we face to kind of um, develop approaches that enable anyone who wants to participate in this to um, contribute to the development of filters that help us in, in, in selecting what we consider to be relevant and what we want to be, to be left out. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Ludo, um, for expanding on your original uh, keynote thoughts on this topic. Um, so finally, we have uh, Dr. Dominic Rosati, who has kindly at the very last minute agreed to step in for Dr. Josh Nicholson um, of SITE. Uh, Josh is unable to join us, unfortunately. Um, and Dominic has agreed to kind of cover this topic, which is quite a, a broad one, really, which is whether the design of new tools and indicators should go through an ethics process. So Dominic, over to you to respond to that. Hello. Um, <laughs> I'm not a doctor, so <laughs> that's one clarification. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I am a machine learning researcher, and I think that um, our perspective m might be interesting from sort of like a, a vendor industry perspective, where our uh, what ethics process means is you know, it, it depends on, on where you come from. And I think, you know, generally our, our position on this is, is definitely yes, there should be like an ethical process. Um, and, and that's not only because um, new tools should be accountable to the community and the, and the users that they have, but, and, and there's like this external responsibility, but there's also, you know, this benefit from the vendor perspective where um, it, we, even though, you know, we strive to have like best practices like in, in developing our technology, such as like transparency of methodology and data sources and all those kinds of things, which we try to do earnestly, like there are ethical concerns that we might not have thought of. Um, and so it, from that perspective, it is very important for there to be some sort of process. And I think, the best way to kind of highlight what we think is um, maybe a, a good process from the industry side um, is to, to discuss the way we do things. And I, and I think you, you've probably seen it a bit um, if you were here with Siobhan's talk and uh, Lizzie's blog also kind of like touches on this a bit, but our, 
our primary mode of um, ethical review, I suppose, at the moment is um, community engagement, where like we really do try to engage the community on on what we're doing at site, um, any changes we make, trying to you know publicize them and get feedback on them, and that, and there has been a lot that we've we've changed because of that. So I think um, like a, a a good thing to highlight is we uh, you know back when Lizzie put out her blog, um, we. It, site really did start out as more of a metric for evaluating reproducibility of articles. Of course, we try to look at how articles talk about each other and, and you know, su support is one factor of that, but we really have moved away from that and moved away from this kind of evaluation use case in general, um, more towards like a research support and literature discovery tool. And that's, and that is because of community feedback and ethical concerns that have been raised. And I think like there are, there is maybe still r room a little bit for um, like our, our approach in, in doing like these aggregate evaluations of bibliometric data. But I think that kind of fits more within the realm of like contributing to a plurality of, of metrics and, and, and less of us wanting to, you know, be in that space as like, this is a, a new metric and so on. Um, and I, and I think like just expanding on, you know, how, how we do that a bit, like, of course we do it in whenever you're building a, an AI tool, it is very important to um, put, put out your methodology. And so we have a pre-prime under, under review that, you know, sort of go, goes through that. And that's kind of like a more formal aspect for us, but, it, you know, Sh Siobhan's talk is, was, is really a, like a, an ethical review for us. And, and, and Josh and I were both there for it. And if you weren't there, you can, you know, look at the video and, and a lot of those things we really did take to heart. And those are the kinds of concerns that we want the community to bring to us so that we can, you know, address them or engage in conversation. And I, that, that's kind of, you know, the anecdotal us kind of perspective. And if I extrapolate that to other, other vendors or, or new tools that are sort of like in an industrial kind of um, positioning, then yeah, I would encourage like people to bring their concerns up and and publicly too, and 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 to have hopefully get a conversation going. I know some of these like you know giant tools is harder, but um, yeah, that. So in short, yes, <laughs> though ethical process kind of means different things, and that's a picture of what it looks like for us. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Dominic. And again, thank you for stepping in at such short notice. Um, I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen now. So hopefully that um, viewers can see us all. Um, and I'm not sure uh, whether, or oh, it looks like we've only got one question in the, the Q&A so far. Um, fortunately, I've got a lot of questions, so you might end up just answering mine. <laughs> so apologies for that. Um, but, but please do kind of keep putting your questions in the Q&A, folks, if you want to um, pose a question to this esteemed panel that we have. But um, thank you all very much indeed. That was a wealth of information. Um, I want to start off with a kickoff question, uh, which I fear might, if we're not careful, become the sticking point to moving forward in this space. And that is, you know, wh where do the responsibilities lie for the appropriate application of these sorts of new tools and technologies that we're discussing? And okay, we're talking about a broad range here. Um, and, and when should this be thought through? So Dominic, you were talking about, you know, using kind of feedback as, as part of your ethics process, but is that is that too late? You know, and so is the responsibility with developers who build these tools? Is it with libraries for buying these tools? And obviously if they're free, that's another, another complication because we don't have any kind of control over them there, um, but we can signpost them, we can train in them. Um, or is it with end users to decide the use case? And I've heard this often, well, we just supply the data, we just supply the tool, a bit like, you know, it feels a bit like, um, uh, um, kind of military manufacturers saying, well, we, we don't fire the guns, we just make them, you know, so, so, so where is the responsibility? Um, and I'm wondering if I can turn Erin to you first from a kind of broad AI ethics uh, viewpoint on this and then perhaps open it up to the rest of the panel. Is that okay, Erin? 
Yeah, I hope you can hear me okay, because I think my internet's not doing very well in the rain, <laughs> just to let you know if I cut out. Um, so, yeah, it's a massive question. I think I will speak from, I think there's there's responsibilities lie with a lot of different stakeholders. Um, but speaking from what we found most recently, I would say at the moment, at least, the greatest responsibility lies with the tech companies that are developing these products in the first place and then if if we look a step back it also lays with the government and the broader public sector in if these companies aren't being responsible in certain levels of regulation and creation of standards um and so i think i i really loved what dominic was talking about community involvement and i think that's so important having that user feedback that kind of human in the loop at some point as a either in the development of the technology or in the ethics review but I think it's so key to get to to get that inclusion of essentially the communities that are going to be served by these technologies right at the start of the development process to make sure that the technologies developed are fair are uh, responsible can be held accountable um and crucially, that what's happening on the back end is transparent. So through things like AI model cards and that kind of thing. So I would say that the ultimate responsibility at the moment lays with the, the tech developers and, and primarily around not only the kinds of methodologies they're using for design and development, but what are they building technologies for um, and how will they be used and thinking through potentially uh worrying ways they might be used or potential biases that might happen through through their use. Thanks very much. C Cecile, can I come to you next? <laughs> As a yeah, you can, you can. I was, I was, I think I don't disagree with Aaron, but I'm not sure I fully agree. So I, um, because I think ultimately it's all of us, you know, um, we are developers and users at the same time. We think more that the end of that large part of the responsibility is with the users. We live in a free country. We live in a free world. <laughs> and so we can all develop our tools and I think it's up to the users to finally decide which ones are the most useful, the most transparent, the most. Um, and so that is why we develop the tools with the user in mind. So we, we, that's why we put those values that I said first, um, because we know that the technology can do way more um, than what we offer. So I have in the, in the process of, um, of developing code sites, we have talked with a lot of people and we have often heard that they would dearly put me into contact with uh, machine learning experts to make it more sophisticated, to make it more complicated. And um, I understand that, but at the same time, we are, we're always keeping in mind the quality of the data. And so you can do more with machine learning, but does, is the data quality of a kind that you can uh, still trust it when you put it uh, in, in uh, uh, that, that into it? I also always tell my, tell my students, I, I teach uh, several statistical classes as well, and I'm also always telling my school students that their statistical approach cannot be more precise than the data. So it's always the data that puts a limitation on what you can do with it. And so, um, but I think, you know, living again, uh, Knowing that we live in a, in a free world, I think we should just develop many tools uh, in, in many ways and see just what the community um, uh, values and trusts. And uh, yeah, so I don't think, of course, as a developer, I have a responsibility, um, absolutely. But I'm also, uh, yeah, it's, it's also the market that, that, that uh, and it's the users who determine what, they, what products are useful for them. Um, and so I think what we offer is, uh, is useful for if you want to search uh, uh, literature. And we have compared it also with other tools that, that do uh, have more complicated algorithms. And we, what we see is that you know, the results are virtually the same. Our exact ranking, uh, when we compare it with other uh, co-citation tools, the exact ranking of which paper is on top, that may not be exactly the same. But if you look at the top 25, we have the same results. And that tells me that a simple is maybe good enough. Um, and but we will see later. You know, we will see later uh, at the end of the day. You know, what's what's research? Uh, what's research? That's a really interesting perspective. Thank you. 
Um, Stephen, I'm wondering if I can come to you. You're a former library director and you now train the next generation of librarians. You know, what responsibility do you think that librarians have uh, when it comes to new tools and technologies? the range of products and the issues that they give rise that they give rise to and explain them clearly going back to the more general picture i think um i do agree with cecile that users have a big responsibility but also the thing that troubles me about this and i i think this comes back to what erin was saying is that there are some significant asymmetries of power very often going on in this whole space and whilst we might say users, they outnumber everybody else, actually the collective power of users could be really quite high. It's so fragmented, very often, users will be making decisions that actually are constrained because every individual user or even small group of users are relatively low on the power stakes. Um, and so very often they, they go, uh, go ahead with what, is, what has become an, the norm. I mean, just look at the use of impact factors. No individual says that's a good idea. And yet all collective, we all collectively buy into them in some way or you know, our, our communities do. So there's a real collective action problem here in terms of uh, addressing the power asymmetries associated with tech companies and so on. And governments can do something to intervene in those kind of spaces, but it, it requires a lot more, I would argue, coordinated governance, governance mechanisms to really try and get the outcomes that we want as a community. And librarians, just to go back to answering your question, have a part to play in that, but only a part, I would suggest. Thank you. Uh, David, I can see you nodding your head vigorously. Did you want to <laughs> come in and Make a comment. I must confess, I was at several points with that, with what the, the, all three previous speakers were, were saying. I have a, a, a slight different take on it in the fact that I think the, the end user of these systems sees the output, but they don't, they're not controlling the input. So the, the, the information that is presented to the user is already has those limitations baked or frozen in to use the, the description from the keynote earlier. earlier. So I think a lot of this does fall back to the data. We're back to garbage in and garbage out. If you build your models on garbage data, what you present to your end user is going to be garbage. And so I think there is, is a very, very clear cut level of attention that must be paid at how the models for these systems are being built. The data in particular that these models are being built on. Particularly, I mean, I've spent a lot of time over the last few years looking at uh, classification schemas, mainly for citations, and, and accurately classifying some of these rarer instances is, is a very, very hard problem. And, and in many cases, the data just isn't out there. The data sets don't exist across disciplinary data sets. I don't feel exist at a high enough level. But yeah, so whilst the, I, 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 to, 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 to come back around, I think the, the, the user is a very, very good feedback loop to have, but I think it needs to start earlier in the process than that. Mm, interesting. Luda, can I ask you from a, a bibliometric scholar perspective, you know, I find bibliometric scholars have a kind of a very, a bird, often a bird's eye view, a kind of neutral approach to the development of these uh, tools and indicators. They do develop some themselves, but they um, are observing what's bubbling up and commenting on that. But what role do you think um, bibliometric scholars have, if any, in the kind of, um, kind of ethical use and application of these sorts of technologies? Um, yeah, I think that um, um, 
basically i agree with most things that that the earlier the previous speakers mentioned uh, so as a bibliometrician i would say there is perhaps one well, just let me give an example to illustrate the point I want to make. So at, at my center at, at CWTS, we produce the Leiden ranking. And um, some of you may know it, it's a ranking of universities. Uh, and, and we try to do it in a way that we feel is, is responsible. Um, and that of course raises the question, what actually do you mean by that, by, by, by responsible? And at the moment, what it means for us, it seems, also when we discuss internally, it means, for instance, that the statistics should be highly accurate. Um, so we put a lot of effort and we are proud actually of, of producing accurate statistics, although sometimes there are mistakes, um, but um, a lot of effort is put into this. It's not really visible to the outside world, but we have a whole team of people doing all kinds of data cleaning, all of that. But more and more, I actually wonder whether this is this should be our responsibility, or whether we should think in a different way about 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 the responsibility of 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 my center as a bibliometric uh, center of expertise, because there's also a bit of a strange idea in this. It there's the idea that we, which is a relatively small team of people located in one part of the world, we are kind of. Um, there's a kind of common understanding of what the responsibilities are that we all have, rather than one single party trying to take responsibilities for things that perhaps you cannot really take responsibility for. So that's a complex puzzle that requires coordination, like, like some, of, some of the other speakers also mentioned, but it's a puzzle that I think we need to try to solve in some way. Thank you, Ludo. Um, Dominic, would you like to have uh, a final comment on this particular question before we move on to some of the uh, questions from the audience? Um, no, I, I think <laughs> I think I'm, I don't have anything really. Yeah, I, I, I thought you kind of covered this really in your your talk, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity just in case there's something burning. But but actually, the, we've yeah. got a couple of questions that are kind of directly aimed at at sites. So perhaps I shall start sure. with those. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> one question, <clears throat> excuse me, from um, Robin Price was that she was interested by the announcement of Site integrating their smart reference check tool into the journal submission system editorial manager. So she's asking, is Site or editorial manager even concerned with any of the issues that Stephen Pinfield uh, expressed on artificial intelligence influencing peer review decisions, so perpetuating bias? Is that a concern or something that Site has thought through? Yeah, so I think for both, it is a concern. And I think for, in general, like our, our other partners that we work with providing reference checks, it is definitely something that's part of the conversation. Um, like if I, and so yeah, it, it's a, it is a big concern for us because, and, and the kind of way it manifests is um, very specific for us is, and it, it kind of touched on the next question too, which is, you know, how, how do you, site provides like, a met, it, it provides what looks like a metric on how, how is this paper supported or contrasted or mentioned and so on. Um, with citation classifications. And so there is a very, it, it's sort of an easy um, path of danger to go down where, you know, um, you, you can easily make these, um, you know, mistakes in your, in your, in your thinking, sort of lazy mistakes where you go, okay, well, you assume those numbers have a complete coverage, which they don't. You assume they're completely correct, which they're not, and you you know you, you assume you don't have to go further, and you can use that data as a summary. And of course, like in in some ways, like uh, you know, 
as bibliometricians, we do look at citations as a sort of summary of a paper. But, you know, this is one thing that we really do struggle with is how, 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 to, how to have some kind of user education and, and so on to avoid that kind of way of, of looking at manuscripts so in the peer review context using references and instead the tool facilitating being able to see how um, the references being used in a, in, a, in, a, in a manuscript are being talked about. And, that, and really that is kind of the, that's the thing we wanna provide and, and that's really what the reference check is aimed at. It's just really a way for, to, to easily get peer reviewers to see what the conversation is um, across multiple degrees of, of citations um and a lot less about you know this kind of what i what i mentioned earlier so yeah it is it is a big concern it's something we think about um and continually change so if anyone uses it and has feedback we're definitely open to that thank you dominic can i, can I ask a follow-up question which which perhaps yeah. is, or david or might even want to come in on and that's just you know how how do we make those limitations clear to end users because it's, it's very clear that yeah. you're aware of um, the limitations and the context in which this tool should be used but once it's out there in the wild you know how, how can we or can we even ensure that it's used you know with, within kind of legitimate parameters is, is there a way of achieving that yeah and I, I think I, I keep reflecting on what Aaron said because and I think this kind of gets to um, Samuel's question which is like, you know, we don't, we, d it's totally true. We don't, the site has different accuracy across disciplines. We don't want people to, you know, tenure promotion community, committees to be evaluating mathematicians when there's a known, very clear difference on citation behavior there where they would be disfavored potentially. And um, so I, th I think, um, like, I, I think that, for us, one of the so one of the ways we've done this, and you saw it in Siobhan's talk, is we really try to encourage people to see like you can flag these these citation statements and and the way they're classified, and you can and that will get a review, and and there will be a conversation about that. For other other ways of of discouraging users, like it, it does become really hard. Um, because, you, you know, you're not going to just have like flashing lights, like don't, you know, this is, um, you know, not complete coverage or something like that. Um, and I think one of, one of the, our next things on the agenda, um, which addresses this is looking at how we can make our coverage more transparent across disciplines. And I, it, so it, for us, it, it's, kind of what I mentioned earlier, it, it is an iterative process where like we, we have, and just like to be clear, you know, site has an interesting funding model in that like we're funded primarily by grants and we did get rigorous ethics review before receiving that money and, and that continues. Um, and so, you know, it is, was thought very early on and there was even more early on and Josh put out a thing that was criticized. So I think, you know, long story short, we, we kind of go through these different ways of seeing a behavior, trying to discourage or trying to redesign or change the tool. So, you know, you wouldn't be able to be a tenure <laughs> committee and, and kind of like take the aggregate numbers in, in, a, in a wrong direction. Of course that can happen. And there is some bit of responsibility on our part to, to you know, try to engage the community so that doesn't happen, but yeah. Thank you. David or Cecile, did you want to come in on that question around making limitations transparent to end users? I, if I just, just say very, very briefly on the back of that, I think it's, it's, it's very heartening to see Dominic and sadly not Josh, but hear from site publicly discussing how they want to develop the tool and how this ethics process should be worked should be used. I think that's really, really fantastic. Now to switch to the second half of your question, I, I think I, I, I don't think Liz's 
piece of military hardware analogy where we just build the tool we're not telling end users how to use it. I genuinely don't think that is too far fetched in this case. And I refer to Stephen's comment earlier about impact factors, where the impact factor started off as one. this um, uh, manuscript review uh, software because I also with with, with code sites we did a scientific study uh, to show that if you use code sites can you rely on the results can you uh, um, and so how do, how did that decision making go so so you decided to move forward with it um, was there any reservation or well I think I have the same concerns as David wanted in it's uh, we see that also with a lot of drugs medications it's, it's more difficult to pull it back. And uh, when did you, how did you decide that your product was ready for implementation? Um, I'm okay to address that, okay. Um, yeah, so I think for a lot of, um, so a lot of the things you see with Sight and the things we do, they're directly because of things we saw people doing already or things we were asked to do. So in this case, it is very much um, a thing where we kept getting feedback that peer reviewers were using site um, to evaluate quality of references, to catch up on um, conversations in the literature that they might not have been exposed to yet, um, or to look at a new reference they might be unfamiliar with. And um, these, and and editors in chief and, and and journal editors doing this and asking us like is there a way to facilitate this more and and that that's where that conversation came from yeah so it was less about us deciding it was ready and more um, you know uh, seeing that this practice was being done yeah well if if I make it spice up the discussion a little bit I don't yeah, let you go yeah. away with, I don't let you go away with the latter thing because you do you do uh, because it's different I'm a reviewer as well um, I also look up references but then it's me as a researcher knowing um, how to interpret the reference and mm. that's different from a an, an an automated tool that you know um, that labels the references like supporting or not supporting. Oh, I, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so oh, oh, sorry. I as a yeah. Yeah, I can see how what I said was interpreted <laughs> that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, we I mean, we definitely would not have done it if we didn't think it was a responsible thing to do. And I think if you and and there's like a double meeting for ready, I think for us, like we had already we were already very comfortable with putting site out as a tool for doing things like this. So I, yeah, I was just specifically meant like ready for integrations as like a, a business perspective, I guess. But yeah, like I, I, we were very comfortable with references being evaluated this way. Again, because, you know, we try very much to lean on like exposing the scholarly conversation rather than sort of this evaluation. Um, aggregates and so on, yeah. Thank you, Dominic. Um, we've got a question from uh, Samuel, which is, you know, how, how do these new tools, especially ones that rank citation type, plan to get around things like Goodhart's law when a measure becomes a target, it seems to become a good measure. So by putting a number to a paper, uh, they say, aren't you essentially trying to get it gamed? I hate to think about the future of adversarial attack derived citation language. Any response to that? I think I think the in terms of gaming, uh, that's why I like code citations a lot. Just in general, not only the tool that we developed, it's less easy to game them. 
you know, you can sell sites, um, but, uh, you know, to co-site and every, every article itself has its own co-citation network. So it is way more difficult uh, to game. And especially when you do the co-citations of a group of seed articles that are on the same topic, it is, uh, it's almost impossible to game. So that is what I like, but I do, I, this is a big worry for me too. So I would not easily go into directions where gaming, uh, and that's definitely with age indexes and with, with citations. Um, but for, that's just what I find one of the appealing things, uh, aspects of, of co-citations. Thanks, Cecile. I think, I think a related kind of follow-up question for me is, and something that I battle with a lot, and I guess a lot of my, my colleagues do, is that, you know, we, we all, we're all aware of the limitations of bibliometric tools uh, and the, the stuff, that, the ones that we use regularly, SciVal and Insights and so on. Um, and also now there's a whole host of new wonderful technologies coming on, on the market, or not even on the market, just freely available. I'm just wondering, and this might be a question for you, Ludo, um, and perhaps you, Erin, for kind of a kind of broader AI and ethics perspective. At what point do the limitations of our analyses, because we all produce these analyses and we all have a page at least of caveats, <laughs> you know, it doesn't cover all the, all the sources and this and that and the other. At what point do our analyses become kind of not, not, not good enough to, to actually, when do we walk away? When do we say, do you know, the limitations of this analysis are so great because the data is not covering all the scholarly literature, the, the quality of the data is really poor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We cannot therefore rely on it to answer this question. When, when, when do we get to that point and how do we handle that? Yes, yeah, I, I, that's that's um, a challenge that we also often face at, at, at my center in Leiden. We do lots of bibliometric analysis and we very often, I, I need to acknowledge that, we write these reports and then there is this section, limitations, and we say you need to be cautious when you interpret the, the statistics for the humanities because this and this and this. But what actually does it mean for an end user when they read this sentence, you need to be cautious. What should they make of that? And why then do you still report the numbers if you tell people they need to be cautious and shouldn't they always be cautious also in, 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 in the sciences? So that is a dilemma. And I think the only way uh, um, to get out of that dilemma is to change a bit the way we think about the use of bibliometrics. So if we consider, as bibliometricians, we consider ourselves to be the experts, we will tell other people what is reliable and what is not reliable in terms of bibliometric statistics, then we can never solve this problem. So at a more fundamental level, I think we need to develop ways in which we use bibliometric analysis uh, as part of, of a broader uh, um, um, analysis where we engage with the end users so that in a kind of equal way we jointly look at the data and we discuss what can be concluded from that data with the end users uh, bringing with them all their kind of domain knowledge all their background knowledge that the bibliometrician clearly does not have and the bibliometrician bringing the uh, the more technical types of knowledge. So that's the only solution that I can see. At my center, we are trying to move more and more in that direction. In practice, it is often difficult because there's always a lot of time pressure and things need to be finished within one week time and people don't want to make time available to, to do the engagement. But ideally, this is, I think, how we should handle this, this challenge. That's a really good point. Erin, did you have any points to make on that? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think there is, um, sorry, the rain's very loud if you can hear it in the background. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting because the end user can list X number of limitations that they find on a certain technology. So I'm talking broadly now because I'm not kind of as, as closely linked to the field of bibliometrics, but they can make this list of limitations, but the, the issue remains that the, the technology is often still this black box. I mean, technically this black box. And so I think one of the biggest limitations is often what you don't know, you don't know in a way. So you may not be aware of the questions to ask. You may not be aware of the types of data sets that the uh, algorithm or the model or you know the broader AI system was trained on. And so you don't necessarily know, you don't have access to those kind of hidden limitations in the black
She says it's on us as librarians to make sure that when we give metric data out, we're clear on what it actually can tell us and those using it to make sure they use it for what is it is intended. And I'm just wondering, Stephen, again, from, you know, in the open access um, kind of community, which I know you're you know, domain expert, um, there's a massive move towards kind of value led purchasing with open access now, isn't there? You know, we've seen libraries cancel subscriptions that didn't meet scholarly communication principles, for example. I'm just wondering, should we as librarians be um, doing the same thing with citation tools and technologies that don't meet our principles? Obviously, if they're free, there's nothing we, we can do about them, although we have got a signposting and kind of training role. But, you know, is, is there something that we can do as practitioners? And how do we influence upwards here to, to make that happen? I think it's a really interesting point. And um, I was talking very recently to somebody who runs a bibliometrics service out of a university library for their community. And interestingly, she said that uh, quite recently she'd had a situation where she was asked to provide a report to the executive board of the university about a particular issue um, uh, and refused to do so and said bibliometrics is not the way to answer this question. And it was a very sensitive question um, to do, I think, with promotions or approach to promotions and uh, sent back a paper, but said bibliometrics is not the way to do this and uh, explain why. And I think actually that I can imagine that really bringing up the, the university <laughs> executive board short and, 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 and trying to influence that decision making at that senior level. And that was a really courageous thing to do actually, and I, I'm full of admiration for that kind of thing, to, to emphasize the, the limitations uh, 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 and drawing a line. Um, on the general question about, uh, about this, I, I think within their own institutions, it, it, librarians have enormous influence, but, uh, but often not control about how things are done, uh, how understandings of various different tools are, uh, disseminated um, uh, uh, and so on. But I think it's important, I, I would say that a lot of these decisions are better made at super institutional levels, right? So librarians have really quite well developed mechanisms for at least national discussions about certain things. And that's where they leverage their collective power in terms of negotiations with suppliers. Um, and I would argue that similar sorts of decisions about um, va values in relation to these kinds of tools could be made at those kinds of levels or even at wider levels in order to leverage the collective power uh, of, of librarians more effectively, rather than having to have some people who stand out, who step outside the game and therefore are disadvantaged because they're not, other people aren't, aren't, aren't making the same decisions. Um, it's that collective collective action thing again. And I think um, using those mechanisms that are fairly well developed, national consortia, is, is one way in which that can be done quite effectively. Yeah, absolutely agree with you there. Did anybody else want to respond to that around value-led purchasing or signposting of tools? Okay, we've got a few more questions. Um, uh, well, David has been busy in the, the Q&A and he's <laughs> made a comment around when academics do it, it's called gaming and when students do it, it's called cheating. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for that, David. Um, and there's a, a, a question for you, Cecile, around the code for co-sites. He's asking, is, is it open? And if not, why would that be? Oh, if it, why it's not open? It is not open. Um, I have no good reason for why it's not open. Um... Uh, but it's the code is so easy. The algorithm behind CoSite is so easy that um, it doesn't, it, there's just no secret behind it. You can easily code it yourself. Uh, the reason why it's not open is because I have not. So if I want to share an open code, I would like to totally approve it. You know, in every so I prove the method what it's doing. You can do manually. You can do exactly the same thing. When you do a manual search, it gives you exactly the same results. But um, I have high standards for uh, for good code, and I I do not hundred percent guarantee that this is 
you know, it is it is good code, <laughs> but that it needs to be efficient and elegant and all those high quality criteria. And I do not know because it's so far we we started from a better version. It's a little bit patchwork. I would like to rewrite the code and then um, at the future point share it. But David, it, the, the the algorithm behind it, there's no magic. There is no. It is it is the simplest tool you can think of. You can easily code it yourself. Thank you, Cecile. Um, there's a question from, well, it's actually, he's saying it's not a question, it's a, it's a comment, but I think it's an interesting one um, from Samuel. And he's saying, you know, I, I do think librarians can and do play this important role of giving context. My worries are much more all about the metrics, sorry, about all the metrics that are now easy to find as soon as you search something like Google Scholar that just puts various so-called impact metrics right on the researcher's profile page. You know, Stephen's point of instituting these at a high level as far as helping to control what metrics are used is a good one. Thank you for your insights. But it's kind of led on to you know, another question that I have and I think about a lot. And that is, you know, with, with the influx of, of these free to use tools you know what control and maybe this is another one for Stephen but but welcome um, input from all the panelists you know what what control do we as practitioners have around the use of these um, tools and services particularly if we are uh, a bit concerned about them um, I, I think there's a, a real challenge in um, uh, not just uh, using the tools but I mean, we all like we all like heuristics, as I've said. We all like simple answers to things, don't we? And where you get certain metrics being used, not in their first intended way, and in a, an overly simplified way by people who aren't really familiar with them, then you've got re, really major problems. And there can be some. Uh, the impact factor is a great example of that. But there can be some examples where you say we can't use this anymore. It, it's got to a point where. It's being used in such a crude way um, that actually it's it's unhelpful. So you know, we just should just stop doing it. Now, I think it's one. There's a real challenge. Let me give you an example of this in my own institution. Whether I should say this, but um, we're a signatory of Dora. Signed it some time ago. Um, uh, before before lockdown, I was sitting in a, a pre committee for promotions and said, right, the first thing we've got to do before this, these CVs go to the promotion committee at faculty level is we've got to remove all of the impact factors because we're a signatory of DORA. And there was this like stunned silence around the room uh, and people saying, but it, it, can't, it surely can't mean that, you know? Um, uh, so s signing up to DORA was seen as a nice thing to do, but actually embedding the principles in the cultures at sort of ground level is a real challenge to, to actually follow through what this actually means to individual decision making in things like promotion committees. And I think there's a real job to do there now. There are lots of standards and best practices out there, but it's about getting them embedded in the real world, which is the real challenge. And I do think everybody in our own institutions have a real opportunity to try and do that embedding, not just say, right, we're signatory of Dora, what's the next thing? It's, it's about really making it make a difference. Absolutely. Um, anyone want to come in on that before we move on to our final summing up? Because that, that does segue rather nicely into my kind of final question, which is, you know, I, I, I read a lot about this and, you know, I, I listen to a lot of discussions around it, but a, a lot of it can be, You know, in both information discovery and in research evaluation and obviously they, those settings are quite different so I'm not sure who to go to first um, 
I'm going to perhaps ask Dominic, would you be willing to give us your Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, uh, everyone will have like a sort of different perspective based on where they're coming from. And I, and I think there are a few different takeaways in, in my mind. I think one of them, I'll, I'll say like one from our side and one from like what I would encourage others to do. And I think one, the one from our side is, and it's, and it maybe it sounds a bit silly, but like, I, I think we're trying to be a role model in, in sort of like the vendor space for bibliometrics tools in the sense of like, being very public and open um, with the bibliometrics and research community. And I think that other vendors should do that, um, like Elsevier and Clairvade and with other tools and so on. And next generation tools should also do that. And I think, you know, um, so then, then the one from the other side is I, I think, you know, if that's the case of a commitment from our, our side, you know, then, I think from the other side, like concerns over things like um, misusing the tool and so on, those should be brought up directly and, and raised. And I think, you know, if you can imagine like raising this to Elsevier and, you know, will they respond? I don't know. But, you know, it, it's kind of a thing that like it should it should be, you know, encouragement of, of more public raising concerns for and it, that sounds like it's not really an action because it is more <laughs> more talking and so on, but maybe like holding people accountable at least to like from the other side to to engage in the conversation at least, you know, is maybe the action. So, but, you know, that's what I'll end with. Yeah, we shouldn't underestimate the conversation. I, I, I don't want to pour, pour scorn on it. And I'm aware of um, the famous Atul Gawanda quote, which is, you know, we long for streamlined technical solutions, but at the end of the day, people talking to people is how norms and standards change. So th these conversations yeah, totally. is how we collectively, you know, push things forward. Um, so that, that's a very good point. Uh, Ludo, you're next on my screen. Are you happy to go next? Um, yes, yeah, I, I must say, I, this is an, a kind of uh, the type of question where I always feel a bit uneasy because, of course, it is uh, attractive to just say things like certain things are, are, are really bad and they should more or less be forbidden. Um, at the same time, I feel that that's a bit paternalistic. It's us uh, um, um, kind of putting us in a position where we apparently are in a position to tell lots of other people who also have uh, um, uh, all kinds of, of expertise that, 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 that we should take seriously, trying to tell them what they should and should not do. And I must say, I, I tend to feel a bit uneasy about, about that. Uh, that's, for instance, also part of my uneasiness about the, the DORA declaration. Uh, clearly, we have huge problems around impact factors, but I think I feel uneasy about the idea of a kind of one-size-fits-all solution. Let's, let's just kind of abandon impact factors and, 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 and that will solve problems, make things better. In some sense, it doesn't, I think, do justice to the diversity that we have in the research system, different communities with different practices. So that's that's a, a bit where I feel I'm always struggling to on, on, on how we should how we should uh, handle these 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 situations. In the longer term, I think the underlying problem is um, and that's not specific to uh, the types of things that we do, but you see it in many sectors of society. Lots of decision making is based or at least informed on, on, on data, on, on, on metrics and all of that. And actually we need better data literacy, uh, literacy in, in, in computational skills, all these things. It should be something we start uh, doing at primary school, making sure that all of us, that we are kind of properly educated so that we don't need to have a small kind of group of people that tell others what to do and what not to do. But we need to reach a situation, build a society where we are all in the position to make our own uh, well-informed, independent judgments. But that's, of course, a major, a major uh, challenge. Thanks, Ludo. Not something we can solve this afternoon. Uh, Stephen, you're next on my screen. So um, it seems to me we're in situations where we have um, community-wide responsibilities and we're all situated in a different part of that 
big uh, ecosystem, if you like, that it's useful to think um, vertically and horizontal, ho horizontally. So, you know, the kind of micro, meso and macro levels, we're all working at a micro level in our own institutions. That's where we have influence, but we can also work at other, other levels. We can work at sort of um, subject community type levels or maybe national, even international levels in various different ways. And those, those interconnect. So the international standards can inform our own local actions and so on. And it's important that we all have ways of working at those different levels and participate in, di in different ways at those different levels so that we can achieve more collectively. So that kind of vertical level, I think is really important. And this is an example of going much higher than our own individual institutions in order to inform local action, which I think is really important. There are also horizontal things we can do. And I think it's really important to cross boundaries for communities like um, this one, for example, to get involved in conversations. So it's not just in a kind of echo chamber or changing the kind of metaphor. It's not just preaching to the choir. It's about um, talking to people in other communities. Like, for example, around policy, I found it really useful, though it's difficult to get these kind of slots, but to go to places like conferences of rectors and vice chancellors and talk to them about these issues. And they're often really, really interested to, to be engaged in this kind of thing. And, uh, uh, and so to find those opportunities where you can talk across boundaries, I think is, is really important. Yeah, excellent points, thank you. Erin, are you able to go next? Yeah, I um, I kind of echo Ludo in that I, I do feel a bit uneasy because I'm kind of coming from outside um, the the direct uh, bibliometrics community, but I, I have noted down a few things that um, I've learned so much from the conversation today, so thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with Stephen that the um, crossing domains and kind of sharing knowledge across domains is so important, and I think that's always a kind of key foundation for developing certain community practices and that kind of thing and developing local standards around making value-led decisions around this kind of thing. Um, I also thought I should point out that we, uh, a number of my colleagues in the public policy program at the Turing have developed um, AI ethics guides around choosing uh, different AI systems within the public sector and now I, I can't speak to whether a similar type of thing exists um, within bibliometrics but if it does and th that would obviously be fabulous if it doesn't that's the kind of thing I would completely en encourage you to engage with communities similar to the Turing or, or people who are in a position to develop those kinds of things because I think we've definitely had feedback around this um, AI ethics guide of how kind of invaluable that is um, for developing these local standards and then and finally and it's something I'm sure you do already is just due diligence I mean I did you know particularly with free um, software, I'm not sure how much information is available, but it's just engaging with the as many people as you can who are involved in the development of whatever product you're using um, is obviously uh, super valuable. Typing the DDNA technology became very cheap. We got a lot of companies. 23andMe is the most famous one, the only one that survived that wave. Now we are in a third wave, not even two years in, and most you know companies that started again with full promise, um, even companies that are thinking about doing genetic testing for embryo selection, um, this will take a few years. And then in the lack of utility, there is just no market. And that is how I also very much look at uh, developments in this field. Although we all, I hope for us all to have their markets or to have, you know, to, to develop tools. Um, I think at the end of the day, they should work. 
and um, that is how I also um, um, look at uh, look at this. So there will be a short term, but there's a lot of interest. You know, we had a relative citation ratio a few years ago um, promoted by NIH, um, and and so already for several years we haven't heard um, um, from them. Um, so there's also new ideas come and they go when they are not proven useful. And I think for, them, for that to happen, come and go, we need a lot of discussion, conversation. We need to bring up the, the you know, the challenges that each of the, each of the tools have. Um, and uh, because otherwise, you know, the wrong tools, like the impact factor, or uh, may stay way too long, or the age index is another one I'm not really a fan of. Um, in the, when there's no discussion, people, people go to believe that those tools um, are useful. So we need more discussion, debate, more sharing our concerns. And then we'll see what, where, where we are in 10 years from now. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. That there wasn't this conversation when general impact factors and H index were introduced necessarily, but there is this conversation now. That does give me hope. Yeah. So, so yeah. and, then you see, and then you see things change. So Ludo can uh, also say, tell more maybe about how the discussion in the Netherlands is developing about developing totally new tools and new new ways of rewarding uh, rewarding science. It's a discussion that's that's ongoing. We see the limitations of certain metrics, and then we want uh, something something better. Mm. And I think when we have this conversation very intensely, then you know, for you know, a lot, then that we can we can go to those those new new ways of, of rewarding and, and looking at the literature uh, more fastly. Yeah, we can move forward more quickly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well. Sorry, you've got the uh, difficult job of going last, David. Is there anything more to add on this topic? Well, I, two things very briefly. I'd like to go back to um, the, the fantastic story that Stephen told about the individual person who took the responsibility to feed it up the chain. And I think that's that's a fantastic example of if we have one thing that we can take away from all of this, it's the personal responsibility for everybody who feels this way to stop preaching to the choir and go and talk to other people about it. But the one thing I would like to, to end on is um, I'm actually, is, is hopefully some good news, is I'm actually part of the On Merit project, um, which is looking at the um, Matthew effects in responsible research and our very own esteemed Lizzie is actually part of the advisory board there. Um, so this is as yet, the, the, this is the current work that's being done at the moment. And one, one of the work packages looked at the promotion, retention and tenure policies of 300 institutes around the globe. And they looked at everything from publishing parishes citation rates and and actually there appears to be some good news on the horizon in the fact that things like citizen science are now starting to take effect and and be seen as having value over and above your traditional citation based metrics so i i do believe we are moving but i do believe the, the conversation needs to continue and the conversation needs to continue outside of those who are already signed up to Dora and signed up to the Leiden Manifesto. And the more people we have speaking in this conversation, the better I think it can be. Absolutely. That's a brilliant note to, to end on. Um, and we're bang on time. Thank you all so much for your the breadth and the depth of the expertise on this screen is fantastic. And it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I'm very, very grateful to you all for, for giving up your, your time and your expertise. I've taken a lot of notes and I, I hope that something actually pragmatic can come out of this conversation as we kind of start to move forward and, and talk intensely about this to kind of speed things up and ensure that they get to a kind of that balancing um, space that, that, that Ludo was talking about in his keynote uh, more quickly. There have been quite a lot more questions uh, and I'm very sorry that we haven't managed to get through them all. I thought that an hour and a half would be too short. I was right. Um, if you, you guys are around, are around and you want to answer any of these questions, I'm sure that colleagues would be very grateful for that. Um, uh, and there's some particular love for, for you, Ludo, who's about to get promoted to ruler of the world, apparently. So uh, congratulations, Ludo, um, on your new appointment. <laughs> Uh, and thank you all very much indeed for your time and for all the fantastic questions. Um, let's carry on this conversation. <laughs>